Good afternoon. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Evolving Strategic Partnerships for Teaching and Learning in the Academic Ecosystem, which is sponsored by Credo. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations afford the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and perhaps a chat panel. If you don't, you can click the button along the bottom of your screen with the dialog cloud on it, and that will open up the chat for you. And in the three dots along the right-hand side of that button um, section of your screen, you should see, if you click on that, an option to open up the Q&A. Please uh, use the Q&A panel to submit questions to our speakers. Um, we'll take some time at the end to answer those. And if you're having any technical difficulties, um, please send me a message through the chat so that I can deal with uh, that privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRL Choice Webinars uh, during the event. So if you've got another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. All right. And as we get started here, I will take a moment to introduce our speakers. They are Dr. Nicole Cook and Raymond Pun. Dr. Cook is an associate professor at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, having graduated from Rutgers University with a PhD in Communication, Information, and Library Studies in 2012, where she was an ALA Spectrum Doctoral Fellow. Her research and teaching interests include human and information behavior, particularly in the online context. Critical cultural interests include human information behavior, excuse me, uh, critical cultural information studies, and diversity and social justice in librarianship with an emphasis on infusing them into LIS education and pedagogy. She is the 2017 recipient of the ALA Achievement in Library Diversity Research Award and the 2016 recipient of the ALA Equality Award and the Lorene Y. Cowan Make a Difference Award for Teaching and Mentoring in Diversity. In 2007, she was named a mover and shaker by Library Journal. Her latest book is Fake News and Alternative Facts, Information Literacy in a Post-Truth Era, which was published by ALA Editions in 2018. And Raymond Pun is the inaugural instruction research librarian at Alder Graduate School of Education and a doctoral student in educational leadership at California State University. Ray has presented nationally and internationally and has published widely, including four co-edited volumes, such as the First Year Experience Cookbook and Asian American Librarians in Library Services. He's an active member of ALA, ACRL, IFLA, SLA, CALA, Reforma and APALA. He is a recipient, a recipient of numerous professional awards and recognitions, including ALA's Achievement in Library Diversity Research Award, the Library Journal's Mover and Shaker Profile, and ALA's Emerging Leader Award. And with that, we are ready to move on to the meat of the presentation. Um, so I will turn it over to you, Ray, to get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're really excited for you to uh, be here with all of us. And I just want to say, uh, in addition to the conversation online that Mark mentioned, there's also um, all of these other um, uh, Twitter accounts you can follow us and hashtags and have a conversation there. So I'll pass it back to Nicole and I'll uh, circle back. Okay. Thank you, Ray. And thank you to Mark. ACRL, Choice, Credo, uh, and everyone who's making this webinar possible, happy to be with you today. So I'm just going to get us started uh, really with some observations um, about information literacy, instruction, uh, and tell you a little bit about how 
it has uh, influenced my career and my work and also some of the uh, trends, if you will, uh, that I've noticed, uh, particularly now that I'm in the position uh, to teach in a library and information science program. So I wanted to get started by saying uh, that we've been talking about information literacy for years, and I certainly don't mean that in a negative way. Um, I mean to imply that we have always been having really robust conversations about information literacy uh, instruction and what that means to us as information professionals. And this slide and the next slide that we'll get to in just a second, um, these are just act Oh, yep, this one's good. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Apologies for the technical issues. It's um, been an uh, exciting Tuesday to really uh, talk about this um, topic. And we'll circle back to what uh, uh, Dr. Nicole Cook has to say. It's really interesting, and I'm really pleased that she's able to join us to talk about this um, topic. So the point of this webinar is actually quite interesting. I was invited and think of something that may make sense to um, many folks today in terms of what we're doing with information literacy and what that even means, right? Like we tend to think that information literacy is centered on the st stage on stage, right? There's always been that kind of uh, direction, but it's actually shifting and that's what we're trying to highlight in terms of these strategic partnerships. And so there's a lot of opportunities and growth, and we'll be sharing on some of the themes and frames and library instruction to enhance and promote these evolving partnerships, whether it's with different um, groups on campus, um, campus partners to community groups. There's a lot of opportunities there. And then the themes and frames will largely focus on sustainability, social justice, and you know, these, these really critical issues that are uh, relevant to what we do and what's going on today. And finally, I want to transition towards the open access tools and resources. There's a lot out there, and this is just a friendly reminder that they're out there for all of us to share and to promote as a community of practice. Um, and hopefully, you'll be able to um, uh, involve and create and disseminate your own work um, and being inspired by what we have talked about today. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a first poll here. Uh, this is a gen generic poll, just wondering uh, in terms of all of you listening, um, if you collaborate with non-faculty partners. So they may include tutors, student affairs, financial aid, writing center, et cetera. And when we say collaborate, we mean it as broad as possible, right? There's no actually informed, embedded, or mapping curriculum role or any sort of a, um, a MOU or whatnot, but rather a open, uh, uh, opportunity um, to really uh, work with these folks to teach and support uh, information literacy. So yes, no, or not sure. And we'll just take a couple of minutes to do this. Um, and so as you're doing this, I wanted to say that I was actually inspired a little bit with this question with the new uh, Association of Research Libraries. They had a new report out uh, recently on um, the outreach and it's a spec kit and you can uh, read it. It's an open access publication and it really defines um, outreach really broadly and supporting library values and so forth. But in this case, I think more aligned toward um, information literacy. So let's see the results. And thank you all for participating. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure as a um, panelist if I'm able to see the results. Uh, Mark, I'm not sure if you're able to see it as well. Hi there, Ray. Yeah, we should be able to um, should be able to see those there. Oh, great! Thank you. Yes, I do see it. Wow. So, uh, just for um, FYI, there's a lot of uh, uh, yes in terms of 107 half. No, there's 32. Not sure, and no answer. 95. Well, thank you for participating. This. Uh, gives the landscape of all the attendees and what they're um, up to and how they partner with, whether they partner with non-faculty. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about strategic partnerships, this is something I had um, created very broadly. Um, I think we need to think about, um, aside from the academic affairs portion, all of these other stakeholders that are key, and I think we all know this already, they are, it's not a mystery, but in terms of 
thinking about uh, these partnerships and how to maintain them, um, why you should even think about considering them, um, really think about the idea of strategic collaboration um, in terms of building the library's presence in introducing and enhancing information literacy in the context of the stakeholders. So I, I share these four bullet points here very briefly, really sharing that um, higher order learning objectives. Obviously, they are all going to be very different. Um, when the library collaborates with the tutoring center, it's, it's definitely um, in a different context supporting information literacy than it is with sustainability office, if your university has one. And the whole point is really to think about road mapping, building further, going ahead, and really um, demonstrating the library's uh, commitment in supporting campus stakeholders, being more outward, facilitating communication um, to enhance that academic quality for students, for our colleagues who are working in these divisions, and also for our faculty, because in essence, the faculty will, will also um, partner with these groups as well. And in general, we know this, it's really, um, as I mentioned, strengthening the library's value and impact on the students' lives and campus-wide goals. Um, whether or not you are involved in strategic committees or priorities in your university context, not necessarily in the library, but within the university, um, this is an opportunity to start engaging with these other groups across campus and then uh, focusing on information literacy and then building it in a way that uh, makes sense for the campus to reach its goal, whether it's for accreditation, whether it's for supporting uh, student um, programming development, outreach. This is a, uh, a really great uh, opportunity right now to do that. And we're going to highlight three of these um, opportunities and how um, you can also consider them as well. Next slide, please. So I bring this article up from the Harvard Business Review because um, back in June, uh, when ACRL President uh, Lauren Presley and I um, had the opportunity to give an, another presentation relating to collaboration and outreach and the field of academic librarianship through Choice 360, um, sponsored by Credo, uh, we had a question mostly on collaboration and what that means and how do we do so much and not be um, stretched too thin or squeezed too tight with what we have to do. And so I thought about this, and, I, and this article came out during the summer, and it's about burnout, right, like in terms of how we collaborate. Um, the article itself really um, does a, a great um, job just summarizing um, what is the problem with collaboration if you overextend. And obviously Ray? what you just saw. Oh, yes? I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just trying to see if you could hear me. Continue. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, and so this is the uh, collaboration without burnout. And um, it's an article that really indicates that we need to be um, strategic with how we collaborate. What value do we really bring? And how do we want to scaffold and elevate what we do without being too squeezed and um, committed to so many values? So one thing I, I, I want to say is that there is an article that just came out by um, ACRL um, College and Research Libraries News by um, Rita Bine, who is um, uh, from University of Toronto, and she indicates that the subject librarians, um, in terms of aligning liaison librarians with research campus priorities. So all of the elements that I mentioned earlier with the sustainability, diversity inclusion, student affairs, all of that should not fall into one person per se. Um, obviously, it's the library, the collective group, but it should be um, collaborative in that approach where it's um, working in conjunction with a instruction librarian or a first year experience librarian, but without the burden of the first year experience librarian being the sole purpose uh, or sole uh, librarian to handle all of this uh, outreach with retention efforts. I mean, this is obviously um, not sustainable in that context, but with a lot of collaboration with liaison librarians um, who should be uh, really going out there, um, figuring out and identifying those partners, um, bringing it back in through information literacy processes, um, that could be uh, a really exciting way to promote the library's value. Uh, next slide, please. So we have here this quote I just wanted to um, mention coming from the publication. Efficient collaborators decide when they do or don't have unique value to add. So obviously, uh, as I mentioned, being strategic about what we can really bring to our stakeholders. And um, obviously, it's a two-way two approach, a dialogue with our um, colleagues who are non-faculty 
who are um, really working closely at the front end with the student. So the value we bring to them is really, in, in, is really um, enabling and improving and in some ways really enhancing um, their work and our work collectively um, so that they're not um, necessarily um, seeing the library as a, a place to visit, a place to study with just simple resources. I think that stereotype will continue continuously perpetuate, but we need to um, think about an um, inward approach to like changing that and with an outward facing strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So I bring to this, uh, these two publications here. This is an opportunity for um, all of our attendees here um, to explore um, these two open access publications uh, created and promoted through Credo. And so um, we'll be talking about them very briefly. I wanted to mention on the left, it's a new one coming out every month. Uh, you're welcome to check it out. It's a really exciting handbook that looks and delves into um, IL strategy using a lot of different case studies for consideration of how you want to build your um, information literacy program from marketing to, to um, assessment and so forth. And then the one on the right, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Credo to really um, take into consideration of all the exciting opportunities that's going on in the FYE space and really promoting ways to support students um, and our colleagues in a, in a community of practice, right? Like what are some of the um, aspects? Well, here are some of the um, areas that we cover. Uh, next slide, please. Um, fo focusing on setups between um, one shots to embedded librarianship in chapter four of the information literacy component and how to really delve into the topics of social justice, multiple literacies, um, the idea or the sort of um, propaganda of fake news and, and integrating that into your instruction program and so forth. So um, this is actually free to read. You don't need to um, necessarily uh, pay or subscribe to you know, any of that. Like there's none of that data wall as uh, librarian Lisa Hinchliffe had um, mentioned before in her article. So this is just open for all to see. So I um, encourage everyone to just explore and then share the conversation in, online. Next slide, please. So library marketing strategies, um, this is what I had mentioned. This is an in incoming book, each chapter comes out, and it's really exciting to see that they mention about secondary school information literacy instruction. So partnering with uh, those who are in high school, your high school librarians, local ones, and then seeing if there's a way to foster that transition so that they're aware of your resources and students who might be coming in can be um, engaged in that process. Parents at orientation, I think this is a, interesting idea. Um, certainly, um, this is something to consider. How do you um, collaborate and support parents who might be sending their first child to your universities? And then and letting them know that the students uh, that will be coming in will be, will have a reference or have a resource, to, a person to go to in the library. It's always a, um, a, a opportunity for parents to connect with the university in this sort of aspect. And next slide, please. So I want to mention this article uh, just for all who are, may not be familiar. This is by librarian Caitlin Angel. She's based at Long Island University. And it's a really great opportunity for you to understand um, in this open access publication called Collaborative Librarianship that she does a, a general exploratory uh, survey of all the um, librarians, instruction librarians who support first year students. And there's about like 38 plus um, participants in the survey. And what's interesting is that she identifies some of the challenges, the barriers, the opportunities, and the collaborators, right? Like who are the main stakeholders for the FYE? And you should consider this as a, a really great way to build on your uh, program, when you're, your, your strategy when you're doing outreach, um, because it tells you exactly um, what, what's going on. And it just came out recently. Um, she's a really great person. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to her. I feel like this article has been helpful um, to see the trajectory of outreach. And then you'll notice that this, it, it, it may not necessarily fall down on the FYE librarians to resolve all the retention and success issues. This is a collective um, work from the library um, as a whole. Um, so that's something to consider. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we move into um, these case studies here. I wanted to highlight this one I, I had saw from a poster about a couple of years ago at the National Diversity and Libraries Conference, NDLC, at UCLA. And this is uh, collaborated with um, library groups and different um, stakeholders. What they've done is create a series of digital badges to enhance and promote um, information learning and student success. So their partners extend beyond faculty. So there's also undergraduate research centers, Office of Residential Life, students, the graduate um, students who are involved possibly. And what's interesting is that they have uh, different kinds of um, online, online modules, digital badges. Oh, I hear some feedback. Is, there, is that okay now? Okay. I think we should be a little better, Ray. Great, thanks. And so uh, there's Office of Residential Life. So what is interesting is that there are different badges catered to um, the students' professional um, development going forward. And as they say, it's an information literacy strategy integrated into assignment design. And it's a really cool um, project that I think uh, could be inspiring for folks who are thinking about ways to sustain and scale um, with the, um, uh, I'm gonna just, Say this quote unquote non faculty um, partners, but rather the, the other stakeholders that really can um, delve into the heart of um, information literacy. Uh, next slide, please. And then this one is interesting. It came up uh, in March 2018. Virginia Tech University Libraries launched a framework for digital literacy, and it's a collaborative process, right? This is another trend we're seeing right here as I've been. Um, saying in the beginning, which is really an opportunity to work with different stakeholders, how to come together and define um, digital or information literacy collectively, and then having these higher order learning. Um, of course, uh, we as librarians are the um, um, experts in understanding, as uh, Dr. Nicole Cook mentioned, we've been having these conversations about information literacy, these robust conversations, but it's also an opportunity to have that um, opportunity to engage with other campus stakeholders, have, get, um, give an opportunity for them to have a seat on the table and talk about information literacy and what it means today. Um, one of the troubling issues that goes on is um, the idea of um, manifestation of uh, quote unquote fake news. So um, it's, there, there are a lot of opportunities there. I've seen a lot of collaboration between um, journalists, programs, and students to really engage and think about um, information literacy from our context, but also like the issues that are going on today. And I've also seen some of the other um, examples where there's a partnership between the library and also um, the university IT to really think about privacy, right? The privacy as an inherent right and core principle of intellectual freedom. And basically to un uh, understand that how do students um, think about um, their, their data and it's being collected and there's been a lot of workshops and so forth. So that's another um, example of this partnership that, that delves into information literacy but utilizes um, key elements that are um, relevant for both parties. And then there's, of course, there's this notion of reading apprenticeship, right? It's this like whole framework to really think about metacognition and how do we have our students, um, our users, really think about their own experiences and how does that help enhance or um, encourage or grow grow their information literacy um, experiences by questioning what they're reading, um, de developing visualiz visualization skills as well as um, critical thinking skills and so forth. And it sort of ends to this point where um, there's something that came up at another report by Tufts University about election imperatives. And so they make a recommendation, basically, um, the U Tufts University encourages um, sort of this uh, participation, civic engagement, and um, not to explain too much about it, but what I found interesting was that they included information literacy as one of the um, recommendations for understanding voting rights, um, history of it, the voting basics, and it's all connected. Um, so we're seeing information literacy beyond um, utilizing library resources, but more in these other spheres. Next slide, please. So we're moving over to um, poll number two. And so um, I wanted to ask here, how many of you are incorporating critical pedagogy or critical librarianship um, and social justice in your library instruction program? And actually, now that I think about it, this is actually a nice, 
segue um, before I move into the social justice approach. Um, and I'm okay totally um, going back and forth, but I just want to check with Dr. Nicole Cook. Are you interested in um, coming back to speaking after this poll? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Great, thank you. So I'll pass back to you. Okay. Okay, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Thank you all so much for your patience. Mark, if you could get us back or maybe, I guess, show the results of the poll and then get us back to the beginning of the slide deck, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what uh, people are saying. So that might mm -hmm. uh, actually change some of the um, direction of what I would have to say later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, let me just share these poll results um, out with you. And then we will jump back to the beginning of the presentation. Okay, thank you so much. So again, everyone, thank you for your patience. So as I was uh, mentioning uh, before my call dropped, uh, is that we've been having robust conversations about information literacy and instruction for years. Uh, and, you know, it's the overall same topic, uh, but we tend to have conversations about, about different aspects or dimensions of the same topic. So. You know, just from this example of books that I have, um, even to raise question, we have a set of books from ACRL about critical library pedagogy. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a book from Library Juice Press about information literacy and social justice. Any number of books about how to practically implement uh, information literacy instruction. Now we're moving into, as Ray mentioned, uh, discussions about information literacy and fake news. Uh, next slide, please. All right, just a few more books um, that uh, we, we've probably seen and, and read and discussed. And this is not even to mention all of the conferences, right? So ACRL Immersion, uh, any number of uh, professional development opportunities for in instruction librarians, any number of listservs where we have discussions. Uh, we have the information literacy framework uh, put out by ACRL. We have the CritLib hashtag and those discussions that happen online. So we're talking a lot. We continue to talk a lot about information literacy, uh, but I think this goes back to Ray's question, can we do more? and actually uh, put our conversations and everything that we know, how do we actually and practically uh, put this into practice, right? Uh, before I came to Illinois, I was an instruction librarian for many years, so I'm familiar with the challenges of the one shot and having only 90 minutes or perhaps less, uh, you know, with classes, and you need to get them up, up to speed. So it can be hard to implement uh, new ideas and have those collaborations because there are only so many hours uh, in that workday. But the other thing that I wanted to mention about these different books and these different discussions is that I think that sometimes it, uh, they lend themselves to this idea of that we silo our ideas. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Uh, in February 2017 uh, at Illinois, we had a fake news workshop uh, because it was, you know, at a, a fever pitch and everyone was very concerned about uh, fake news. And what I discovered from other colleagues, uh, some students that were in attendance, is that people felt as though they were at a loss about how to deal with fake news. And some of the students I had actually had in an information literacy instruction course. And so my response was, you do know how to address, you know, fake news because you know how to evaluate information. You know how to think critically about sources. And it was really just this kind of realization uh, that we have the skills and we don't always transfer them and they're not always transferable. And I think that happens a lot with our students, our patrons, and the folks that we work with. And so that presents new challenges for the work that we do. So how do we make these skills transfer, excuse me, transferable and actually how do we, uh, how can we begin to do more in the work that we do? Next slide, please. So the other observation that I made uh, is this idea is that everything old is new again. So the next two slides that I'll show you, these are actually slides that, in points that I used when I was an instruction librarian, and this is uh, 
between almost 15 years ago. Uh, so the picture I have on the screen here, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, uh, is a site about Martin Luther King Jr. And it has the Martin Luther King Jr. Dot org uh, URL, but it's actually a website that is produced by a white supremacist group called Stormfront. And this was one of the examples that I would typically use in my information literacy courses in terms of trying to help people understand how to critically think and evaluate resources. And so I know that you all know all of these things, but these are the same types of points that I'm now giving in workshops about fake news. How do we uh, move past and combat fake news? Next slide, please. And so again, this is another slide that is very similar uh, to what I used to do when I was in a library classroom. Uh, the only difference being uh, some of the sources uh, that I might direct people to to triangulate their information. Triangulation, are we, are we finding the same story and information in multiple places? So again, we have the same conversations, uh, just with different dimensions, uh, but we need to be transferring those skills. Uh, and so we can uh, collaborate with others. Next slide, please. And what I'll end with, um, and I think um, this is working well, very well with what Ray has been saying and how he will wrap us up. When we're thinking about collaboration, particularly with information literacy, how do we move away from teaching and learning in isolation? And sometimes that can be very hard to do. But are we thinking broadly and across disciplines? Ray mentioned having interdisciplinary conversations, uh, the example being fake news, but are we having these conversations about any number of topics? And I've mentioned transferable skills to you already. Another idea is meta-literacy, meta and there are several books uh, that ACRL has put out on this topic, and it really is trying to get us to think about literacy more broadly. So, for example, I worked in information literacy. I have another colleague uh, whose specialty is media literacy, and then there's visual literacy, and then there's computer literacy, and there's any number of literacies. And while it is important for us to know the different components of these different types of literacy, can we look at them in a broader sense and look at literacy in a way that will allow us to have conversations not only with each other, but with people in different disciplines? And of course, this uh, goes right in line with critical thinking. And, you know, preparing for the next iteration of fake news or whatever the next hot topic is uh, that calls our attention. And really getting to this idea of how are we working with our patrons and students about how to think versus what to think. And I'll give you a very quick example. Um, I'm in an online group uh, for instruct classroom instructors, um, particularly those who work in the area of sociology. And someone posted just this week, uh, he said that his students are having so much difficulty deciphering between popular resources and academic or scholarly resources. And so he was putting this question out to the group, what links and videos should I share with the class so I can talk to them about it and teach them how to identify an academic resource? So as the librarian that I am, I responded to him and said that his campus library should have some resources uh, that would be useful to him and if he was willing to give up the class time, a librarian would actually come in and do the session for him. And so, you know, that's a whole other discussion and a whole other panel about, um, you know, our worth, right, and, and how we promote ourselves to those outside. Um, but for the purposes of this conversation, this is a good example of how to collaborate. Many, many other examples of how to collaborate, but just trying to, um, really get everyone on the same page about are we having the same conversation and how can we work collaboratively and interdisciplinarily to advance the information literacy agenda. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ray uh, and look forward to any questions at the end of the session. Thank you so much. So we are back on the very important topic as uh, Dr. Nicole had mentioned, really thinking about issues that really concern at the heart of the campus today. And so um, social justice is obviously one that really speaks to different contexts across the disciplines. 
Um, as you see here, this is a series of word clouds. I think we could find ways to address that. And of course, I see the results here, going back to that for a second. There are about um, 30, 40, 30%-ish, 30 uh, well, in terms of uh, participants, about 15, 18, 13%, 55%, uh, uh, no answer. So hopefully, we'll get um, higher for yes um, going down the line. Because this really addressed um, not just, of course, how students develop critically, analytically, their skills using information resources, but also their well-being, right? And um, it's something I, I've been having a lot of discussions with a lot of colleagues. In higher education, are we interested and vested in transforming the student's experience? And to what extent, right? Do we want to change their uh, collective identity and really have them understand um, what we're seeing? Or do we want them to also keep some part on their, of their own and understand that they need to really find ways to um, address these um, inequities and uh, systemic racism that occurs within and with, within and outside of different contexts. Um, so social justice is um, one example. I think uh, the next ones I'll show that are very, very straightforward. How do you include that in your live instruction collaboratively with different partners? Next slide. Thanks. So uh, this is an example that many of you might be familiar with. I have mentioned this uh, several times in other webinars and talks. I want to mention this again because it speaks so powerfully about how we can even ingrain um, the context of issues like white supremacy. So back in 2017 and during the summer, I was a, a librarian at Fresno State supporting Summer Bridge Program, which is for incoming first year students who are um, socioeconomically disadvantaged and who are in this really exciting program to um, learn about the campus pulse. So we had a lot of workshops during the summer and this was actually during the time of the Charlottesville um, March, the incident at the University of Virginia. And uh, right after that, um, in between, I talked to the Summer Bridge coordinators and they said, yeah, because I, I, I really wanted to show students this mind map that um, comes from Credo, but showing them how and complicated white supremacy is and whether or not and how it speaks to the students' experiences. And so this is an opportunity that we work together very, um, very hastily and just very um, on the fly in the sense like we, it, the, the incident happened on the news and everyone is alarmed and we want to address this so that students can make sense of what it means. It's, is it neo-Nazis, Nazis, what kind of um, relations with KKK? So we had a lot of good discussions. This happened about three or four uh, workshops over time during the week right after the incident. And then understanding what that means in terms of information, access, and meaning. And if the students did not and were not having access to such information, would they have known that this um, group, white nationalists, is directly connected to some of the issues going on um, historically, whether it's a continuum, whether it's an isolation, it was an opportunity for them to reflect and really think about this issue before they even start their first year experience and how it connects to some of these names right here, um, like Robert J. Matthews to the um, Southern Poverty Law Center, and, and giving context, giving them ideas to explore and understand that the library research and the resources can be really um, impactful for um, this kind of dialogue. So uh, this, in a sense, is an opportunity to really engage um, the, the, the challenges that we're facing today. Um, uh, and it's an opportunity to really understand historically, right, these issues and how information literacy can cut right through with a program such as Summer Bridge. Uh, next slide. So this is another example I have mentioned several times. I work closely back at Fresno State with the, my colleague, Bang Bang, who's the Women's Studies Librarian, and also with the Women's Studies Department, which is her liaison department, with our Cross-Cultural and Gender Center. So in March, it's Women's Her Story Month. Uh, we have these open workshops, and sometimes we're embedded in the classes of Women's Studies 101 to have um, students uh, really uh, enhance and promote um, Wikipedia entries about women, uh, whether it's women's rights, um, women's history, um, women's, um, you know, so, sort of the, um, the, the context of um, the entries of women in, throughout Wikipedia, because we know that there is a huge discrepancy, there's huge marginalization, lack of participation, and we want to encourage that. So these were really great um, opportunities for 
um, students to understand, well, there's information inequities. Uh, why is there so much more information about Nobel Prize winners who happen to be men as opposed to women? So, you know, giving them that context at that year for that general education program in women's studies was an opportunity and um, really um, celebrating uh, Women's History Month across campus uh, with such uh, workshops and programs and light refreshment and people utilizing reference material, whether it's online or in print, they get to see what we have and see that this information can have value. So in terms of Wikipedia, is a, many of you are, have done it, this is not necessarily innovative, but what's, what's great is that it's a collaborative opportunity to instruct, to engage with different stakeholders um, beyond the academic context. Uh, next slide, please. So we move on to sustainability, right? And we know that sustainability is actually not necessarily um, the three R's, recycle, reuse, purpose, et cetera, but it's also a social justice issue. So I wanna uh, take a moment here for these two points to really think about the global to local context. For instance, the United Nations have these new sustainable development goals that they want to align many, many countries to these issues, whether they're poverty, women's rights, literacy, education, and thinking about sustainability in an interdisciplinary form, as uh, Dr. Nicole Cook mentioned, really um, goes beyond this, uh, this uh, green studies or environmental studies, but includes that in addition to social justice and also um, the context that I mentioned earlier. So how do we um, take these sort of big issues that the UN might be um, encouraging and then adapt it into our local context? Well, for many of you might be thinking about campus sustainability, of course that's an opportunity to um, different kinds of uh, partnerships with your office of sustainability or student groups in environmental studies. But then like, how do we engage learners in sustainability practices in library instruction, aside from the traditional disciplines that I had mentioned in the sciences or in possibly um, the social sciences? But there are ways, uh, next slide please. So I want to bring attention to um, this new um, upcoming book. I am co-editing with Dr. Gary L. Schaefer, who is the new director at Glendale Public Library. And we are excited to um, mention this Sustainable Libraries Cookbook. It's um, through ACRL. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of uh, really great recipes for you to think about, because uh, this cookbook is an edited volume with a selection of different kinds of case studies, best practices for you to replicate. We call them recipes, but um, it's, it's a, the idea is to encourage and foster the community of practice looking at sustainable, sustainability as a core issue. And so some of them might include how to develop a seed library, create a, a, a bike lending program, to really looking at um, the UN's sustainable development goals and how do you integrate them into your library instruction. So it's community practice to um, in, an engagement to the content of teaching, research, and learning. How do you use environmental data literacy programs to the, uh, the triple bottom line, which is a whole um, pedagogy and approach that I won't get into, but there are a lot of really interesting ways. Next slide, please. So this is one example by uh, Lalita Naharaj from CSU uh, San Marcos. I had asked her if she was okay for me to share this and she uh, was delighted. So this is an example of utilizing um, information, critically evaluating information resources relating to sustainable agriculture. So um, she had put this together, really nice recipe, but thinking about critical and feminist pedagogical methods to analyze and question the resources um, in terms of power dynamics and having those conversations, um, whether or not they are related to sustainable agriculture, and we know that there are many great um, opportunities for discussion. But this in itself has been really helpful. Um, when I looked at it, it gave me an idea to think about other uh, topics that could be uh, relevant, but then utilizing those lens and incorporating into your library instruction and really thinking about um, real world implications. That's um, really the heart of the um, conversation here with her um, recipe. So um, I think this is um, a series of really great um, steps instruction, there's a nice lesson plan, um, and having opportunities to think about um, the power structures that exist when we access or find information in agriculture or um, in other contexts. Next slide, please. And here is another one by uh, Naomi Bishop, who is at Arizona. Uh, this is looking at indigenous communities and sustainable development. This one is really interesting because it's targeting towards engineering students and thinking about 
what environmental justice in this context means for um, engineering students to think about ind indigenous frameworks and indigenous knowledge, and how do they, um, students utilize indigenous environmental issues and information um, to understand um, the engineering information and whether there is sort of this um, idea of um, thinking about um, different opportunities to engage with these areas to enhance and improve engineering information literacy. So um, this is also a, a nice lesson plan, really straightforward case study, but has delved into that um, indige indigenous justice part that I think uh, many of you um, would find helpful and useful to engage with students in engineering or in, um, in the sciences in general. Uh, next slide, please. So we move, move on past into this um, other area that I want to mention, which is service learning. So um, many of you might be familiar that service learning, and you see their HIP, which stands for High Impact Practice, a series of active learning techniques that help promote student retention and success by the Association of American Colleges and Universities. There's also um, service learning as being one of them, including internships, e-portfolios, capstone courses, diversity, and global learning. So service learning is a really great opportunity because it really helps understand um, the, the students' uh, involvement with the community and how do they um, support the community, learn about the community, and so forth. So this is a, the third S that I want to talk about. Um, next slide. And so this um, service learning, community-based learning, is something that I think many of you uh, might want to consider and uh, take back into your own uh, practice. And uh, we'll move on to the next slide, which I believe is a poll, the last poll. And this question here is, how important is service learning community engagement to your library? And so this is a very important, important, slightly important, not at all important, or not sure, not applicable. So sort of like a, a Likert scale. Um, and to take a couple of minutes, we will uh, get right into it. So I'm really curious to see how many of you are um, implementing service learning activities in your um, library with curriculums or with different uh, faculty or programs. Okay, the poll has just ended. Let's see how and what the results are. Okay, so it shows that it's somewhere very important, important, 18, 18 participants, 35, or important, 34 slightly, not at all, seven, not sure, 27, and no answer. Okay, thank you for um, responding. So um, next slide, please. I wanna to call to your attention uh, this a uh, new book by um, university librarian Jennifer uh, Nutfall, which uh, she's at Santa Clara University, Service Learning Information Literacy and Libraries that recently won the uh, ACRL Instruction Section Award for publication. It's a really um, fantastic uh, edited volume that really looks at service learning in different contexts. And service learning, is, is it falls into this idea, this, um, not idea, this frame actually this of social justice, where it's an experiential education that really has students reflect through the process how they solve community problems reflecting their own experiences and so forth. And the book itself is really a great collection in terms of different essays um, from pedagogy to case studies and really think about how civic engagement inclusion works within service learning and partnering with different stakeholders um, to really support the opportunities and the resources that the library can play. And I encourage everyone to look at this. Uh, next slide, please. And it goes on to my own experiences, having done a lot of community service outreach with our office to teach and address the digital divide in Central Valley in California. So this was based on a presidential grant that we were able to receive. And so a lot of students we recruited were bilingual and, and eventually they were able to teach information literacy, data privacy, and selective public libraries through the academic library at Fresno State. And so I had a lot of conversation with many um, folks who are in computer science, in um, education, they were really excited that this idea came through and we were funded to enhance and support 
our community. And so they wanted to expand it further. And this is an example, um, not necessarily a full-fledged service learning uh, program, but it's, it's, a, it's a micro example of what we can do as uh, librarians to really help um, support our communities through this effort, um, through having students understand the real issues here. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in terms of collaborating with your community engagement or service learning office, um, think about ways to embed and foster information literacy programs. Obviously, um, it would be very helpful if there is a class that already does it, but that office can also connect you to a professor who can do that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about um, information literacy in the context that I shared, which is teaching IL, but also thinking about um, students being involved, doing research on real-world community issues. And then how do they make sense of such data, the discrepancy of it? And then sharing that as a result through reflection or peer-to-peer -peer and aligning our learning objectives, whether it's information literacy or framework in terms of that community engagement aspect, that the library isn't just situated inwardly, but rather an outward stance and willing to collaborate and support um, our community members. Next slide. So we're moving over um, to the last um, few minutes. This will probably take a minute to go over these open source resources that I want to mention. Next slide. So for those of you who are not familiar, this is the ACRL Framework for Information Literacy Tools Toolkit. This is free for anyone who is interested. We are um, ensuring that um, people who might want to know more about information literacy in the context of the framework uh, utilize the source. Um, this is part of the Student Learning and Information Literacy Committee book, which I'm part of, and it's really exciting. We're trying to promote and get more folks to utilize it. And this can be an opportunity in conjunction to what I've shared and um, what you might want to think about and what Dr. Cook has shared um, and uh, aligning it together. Next slide. All of you might be familiar with the Sandbox. This is the from also ACRL, it's a repository of lesson plans, case studies, um, ACRL publications in some cases. And you might want to think about um, contributing. If, you're, if you are working on something on social justice, sustainability, fake news, please start sharing it. It is um, an opportunity to share with the community at large. Next slide. And of course, this is the peer-reviewed instructional materials online database. A lot of great stuff here. Um, Primo, as many folks know, it's from the instruction section under ACRL. Um, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, Liz King, who is part of the committee, has uh, always told me that there's a lot of great stuff there, and, and I encourage everyone to explore as well. And uh, the opportunity to think about, I think the submission had, had this happening uh, this week, but if you have something, share it through and so others can see it. Um, next slide. This is another uh, exciting one. This is the last one I want to show. It's the Community of Online Research Assignments by the Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Really great stuff. Um, similar to the repository for ACRL Sandbox, but has a lot of great tips and, and, and really um, engaged um, format in terms of blogging and other uh, materials that you might want to um, consider exploring and sharing. Finally, next slide. So we are down to um, this sort of final thoughts from my end. Really think about library instruction as a strategic, inclusive, and accessible approach with different campus partners. I've already named a couple of them, but there's certainly more, and you need to think about ways to build that into your own current curriculum. Next. We think information literacy in intersecting context. We certainly have shared them, and it's an opportunity to really um, delve into these core issues that ties into social justice, civic engagement, and um, critical and information literacy thinking. Next slide. And finally, we want to transform students in a, this sort of community approach, right? We want to holistically help them understand that we have a lot of resources with the campus partners and really um, engage with them. There's a lot of opportunities out there uh, that I have shared, and hopefully it'll inspire you to consider them. Next slide. Okay, I am done, and thank you so much for listening and uh, bearing with us. Absolutely, this is Mark from ACRL in Choice. My apologies for the, uh, the technical difficulties uh, there at the beginning. Um, we've got just maybe a couple of minutes for questions. Um, there are a few in the hopper right now. Um, I would say if you do have a, a pressing question for either uh, Dr. Cook or, or Ray, please uh, drop it into the Q&A box now. Um, 
And looks like we've got a, a question here uh, from Tim on, it looks like, uh, fake news and that sort of thing. So Tim asks, what are your thoughts and or experiences on web browser extensions such as BS Detector, Trusted News, Fake News Alert, etc., that are designed to assist patrons in evaluating websites? And Dr. Cook, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I don't disagree with them. I don't think they're bad. I, I don't want us to get to the point where our patrons and students are relying on them. Um, with some of the undergrads that I've talked to, some of whom have actually built their own extensions, uh, the kind of the thinking is if we have this plug-in, then we don't have to do anything. Uh, and I maintain that the evaluation of information, fake news, et cetera, still requires some manual labor and effort on our parts, um, even if we just keep things in mind, um, but just not having this uh, over-reliance on technology, because technology can also be biased and incomplete and incorrect as well. Hmm. Absolutely. Uh, um, we've got a few more questions here, and we had a, a question sort of early on in your presentation, Dr. Cook, about uh, critical pedagogy, and Hindishi asks, what exactly do you mean by critical pedagogy? So I think this is a lot of what Ray was uh, speaking of uh, during his portion in terms of incorporating diversity or social justice or uh, current topics or things of that nature uh, into the instruction. So hmm. this idea of moving again towards action and this idea of moving towards how to think as opposed to what to think. So this idea that if we're doing instruction, not only hopefully will uh, the folks listening to us be able to find their information uh, when they leave us, but they'll know how to think about it. They'll know how mm -hmm. to think about all of these surrounding issues and the positives and the negatives, the pros and the cons, and not just you know getting this point A to B, I need these three articles to write my paper. Mm -hmm. So that would be it in a nutshell, if you will. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And, and Ray, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Cook's response. And uh, that is something I think all of us uh, should be striving towards. It's a, uh, in some ways a call to action, really, to what we do as educators, as advocates for our community, for our partners. And also, there is a, um, uh, this was, I think, last year, actually, it was a, a webinar we had done. I worked with Kenya Flash from Yale University on social justice and critical pedagogy and library instruction. So it's free um, so on YouTube if you want to see under Credo Reference. Thanks. Hmm. Great. Great. And um, I think we're, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, and it looks like some folks are, are beginning to, to take off on us. So I, I'll just uh, jump in here and say thank you to everyone out there listening in today. Um, we appreciate your time. And I would also say thank you uh, to you, Dr. Cook, and to you, Ray, for your time today and for um, all of your effort that went into both putting this webinar together and to making sure that it happened. We, I, I personally, and I'm sure everybody out there, really appreciates that. Um, and uh, I'd also remind folks that we did record today's program, so if you had trouble with the audio at any point, there should be a recording available to you. Um, I'll make sure that gets out to you probably first thing tomorrow morning. Um, and if you do see the link to our brief five-question survey in the chat box, please take a moment to fill it out and let us know how we did today. Um, we appreciate all of your feedback. Um, and I would just say thanks again to everyone out there for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed the session, and I hope you have an excellent afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.